Are we live, Frank? Yeah, we, no. yeah, we live. I don't see it. It don't tell me it's live. It's the iPhone. I don't know what's going on with your iPhone now. It ain't an iPhone. It's an iPad. It's an app device. It's an app device. Now it says it, that exponential is live. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Howdy. We've had full blown conversations and didn't even realize we went online. <laughs> We've had some good conversations already. Um, these guys on here, I love them. I'm spending my life with them. Hopefully, and I got a fly in my house. I hate them flies. I, I hate them. I hate them too. Yeah. I'm out here on the porch, man, and these dogs, these dogs have been um, eating outside on the porch, and they have just flies everywhere. Yeah. Oh, did your hair slip back? What? It's Pastor John G, your hair is slick back. I noticed when we got on the call. Oh, no, it's because it's sweat, man. I've been out here in the garden. <laughs> he's, he's, a, he's a gardener. I thought you had some gel or something just sticking on back. I said, real, no, real man, cool. that's just that's natural. That's natural. That's what you get when you, when you get to be the John G. When you work. When you work outside, yeah, yeah. Get a little sweat. <laughs> hey, do y'all have any ponds on y'all land? No, no, we live in town. It just looks like I'm in the country. Okay. No, I don't have. I had one at the my dad's old house, but did you ever fish in it? You know, there. <laughs> it's funny you ask. Uh, we never realized there was any fish in it. Oh god! But um, one day, uh, one Fourth of July. I got some, um, we had those waterproof grenade, like firecrackers, you know, you could throw in the water uh -huh. and I was going to show all the kids, you know, so they could throw them at the little, it was a little bitty pond, little stock pond. And so I was showing them and I chunked one in and it went to the bottom and you could see it bubbling and then went boom. And like three seconds later, this one lonely fish floated up. I killed wow. a fish in the pond. It was like it looked like a goldfish, like somebody had put a goldfish in there and he grew up. Oh, okay. I know. Yeah. I'd like to have a nice stock pond full of catfish. That'd be good. Oh, I love catfish fishing. Walk out the back door and grab some, grab a fish. Derek, Derek know about that catfish. I mean, this one probably cook it, but I don't want to have to clean it. I really can't stand the smell of fish. I just like to eat it. Get out of here. Yeah. Yeah, if it's fishy smelling, I got, can't stand it. Wow. I don't know. Seafood, I don't really do much seafood. You don't, that's my favorite food. Yeah. So you don't do like the crab legs? and I don't really get, I mean, I will if they're there, but I don't, you know, I don't go for it. Don't, you know, I'm more one of a thing I, One thing I've learned to love in the last year is fried lobster tails. Oh, I bet that's good. Deep fried. Really First good. time I ever saw that, I saw Bobby Flay do it on a Japanese Iron Chef, and they about had a cow because he deep fried like some three hundred dollar lobster tails. <laughs> it's, an expensive, it's an expensive venture. I bet it is deep fried. Bro. Oh my gosh! I bet that is rich. Oh yeah. For, for a person, you're going to need probably four lobster tails, three to four lobster tails per person. Nice $60 lunch. <laughs> yeah, can you and your wife, it'll be about $60. Yeah. Wow. Isn't, isn't right. that wonderful? Mm -hmm. And normally you use them just as... Um, are there uh, appetizers? Appetizers. Okay. Really. But so after that, there's more to come. Yeah. So, so like, if I invited you and Lisa G to the house for a crab ball, and we had appetizers for the lobster tails, it'd be about one hundred and twenty dollars for the lobster tails. Wow. That's the appetizer, and then about another one hundred and twenty-four. So about two hundred fifty dollar meal. Out of something that just comes out of the water, you know. You just got to live close enough to go snatch them yourself. <laughs> Man, when I was in Costa Rica one time, down by our house in, in, uh, in um, 
Hartwell's. Yeah, but uh, well, right at Puerto Vallejo, Puerto Vallejo. Uh, they were out there, the locals were out there deep, just, I guess deep, I said deep sea diving, but they, they, they ride a boat out there about a half a mile off the shore to this little mountain. I guess this thing growing up out of the out of the water, right? Yeah. And, now? and they, they jump down, go down, come up with lobsters that if you stood them on their very end of their tail and stood them up, they come up to their waist. And uh, they, they got a lobster is <laughs> gonna fight back, man. <laughs> yeah. And so they come on, they, they, it'd be dead, and you know, when they brought it to shore. And uh, I said, hey, I wanna, I wanna get one of those so I can cook it. And they said, Pastor, it'll cost you about $80. I said, you just went out there 20 minutes ago. <laughs> I said, you got like five of them. I'm not giving you 80 bucks for one lobster. I said, not going to happen. And they walked off. But later on, I ended up, somebody ended up giving me lobster. <laughs> you know. Yeah. <laughs> and then I was down there at one time. You could just pull money out of the water. Right. Like you, like you did the lobster. Yeah, we, what we need to do is just I'll get a trip and go to my house in Costa Rica. Yes. Mm. Wouldn't that be fun? Yeah, yes. let's go two weekends from now. Two weekends from now. He's so specific. Two I gotta weekends get a, from I got to get my passport together, man. I'm, I'm going to tell you this. When when all, all my staff get uh, their passport, I'm going to fund a trip to Costa Rica. It's cheap to fly there now. Right now it is. And we can get That's the Florida right. pretty cheap too. Like you can literally hop on a plane, get to Florida. But I oh, think yeah. it's cheap. When I was going to Costa Rica, like for a while, every other weekend, um, people thought I was rich. But all it was, it was right when um, it was like fifty Spirit, bucks, wasn't it? Like it was like Spirit, when Spirit just came in. Yeah, and I, I would have to fly to like Fort Lauderdale, and uh, and all of that. And yeah. then we would uh, catch a plane from Fort Lauderdale to uh, to Costa Rica. It was amazing. Yeah. And so we did a lot of ministry down there. A lot of ministry in uh, in Costa Rica. At that time, we were mentoring quite a few pastors down there. And I was learning about the mission field and how to interact and, and all of that. And so it was a great time in my life where God really grew me. Culturally, mm -hmm. I think culturally through me. And so, but yeah, so so what's been going on in everybody's lives? Nothing? I've had a wonderful time. Uh, Springdale, Arkansas. I went to Spring, Springdale, Arkansas this past uh, Tuesday. No, no, Wednesday, Thursday. Wednesday, Thursday. Yeah, Wednesday, Thursday. Expenses paid. That's just my food. Um, I wonder because I I'm, my business is subcontracted to this uh, data. What's it? I was considered like a, a data uh, this database company, and they sell their systems to it. Their software on these expensive uh, systems. For like I think the cheapest one is like a million dollars. So I went out there uh, on their behalf to change out some hard drives. I went to uh, this famous chicken company that I won't name just in case because I don't want to lose their contract or get sued. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like going down to their uh, to their headquarters. And this picture. So you enjoyed doing the IT thing up in Springdale, right? I did. Okay. I did enjoy. I did. I've been in, in the hot tub for the first time. It's happy. Anyway, anyway. <laughs> no, I, I'm not finished now. <laughs> uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh. Anyway, anyway. I've been thinking a lot about uh, several things. Um, and so I want to integrate several of the things I've been thinking about all week. <laughs> um, yeah, I saw your head do the thing there. Yeah, so. But, but one thing I've been thinking about is the cultural aspects of the gospel 
gospel's message in light of local culture, uh, prejudices. The cultural aspect of spreading the gospel in light of local cultural prejudices. Do y'all understand what I'm trying to say? I think so. Okay, let me see if I can give an example and maybe you can help me expand upon it. Um, for instance, when, when we talk about an online church or even reaching a particular demographic with the gospel of Christ, say, I'm gonna just deal with what I think is a white elephant in, in, in the US, uh, come to church planting and missions, okay? That uh, we try to do it along um, racial lines for the most part. You know, we still call black church, white church, Asian church. And each group tends to think that church needs to be done the way that they think it needs to be done for their culture. And that if it's another way, then it's not legitimate. Have you all ever seen that happen or am I just batting in the wind and saw things that you haven't? You can deal with church plants specifically or just- uh, Just missions, just dealing with church itself. Like for instance- right. uh, I understand what you're saying. Like, okay, let's say if we if we hopped up right now, right? And let's just say, we're I don't know, I'm going to a Korean church, right? And we only do things, we've done things one way in a U.S. And then when we go over to another country and plant a church, we start trying to teach them and what, well, let's just look at this. When you're talking culturally, we bring our instruments of worship, like an organ, a piano, uh, some tambourines, a microphone, etc. Now, and we teach them American hymns, right? But in the language of their culture, which is not bad, you know, nothing wrong with it. But we're we're busy. We get kind of tied up trying to reteach people something new when they can just worship God with the way they would, you know, whatever style of music. And that's usually what it boils back down to is the music is where, you know, cause most of the service is kind of whether you're sitting on the floor or one guy's talking or everybody takes turn talking, it's usually the music we're talking about. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in, in one, in my case, that's what I'm talking about. And uh, yeah, I've seen it. I've seen it um, I mean, even, changes in time you know over the time have been difficult for the church to just adapt to new styles of music much less just allow people to worship god the way they you know with a style of music that they're used to like when i go to my buddy in pakistan's church online um it's like being at a rave i'm not even joking it's like listening to some Psy trance has got there's lights blinking in and they got a karaoke machine thing in the background. <laughs> you know, it's totally wild, man. It, it's very, it's very different. Like I think it would startle and maybe make some um Western church people feel uncomfortable. You know, they might have to lead one praise and worship song before they got out and preached, so they wouldn't think they were, you know what I mean? They'd like to get get up and sing something uh American, get the spirit right, think feel the spirit, you know. Um, which, yeah, I've seen it, you know, it's real funny because as multicultural as America is, you know what I'm saying? We do worship in our own little pockets, which is, I, you know, it, it ain't always bad, but sometimes, it, you know, it can be, especially if you're saying my way is the way, you know, especially when it comes to, I can't fellowship with them because I just can't get into it. You know, because it's too loud or it's too quiet or it's too this or it's too that. So is that kind of what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Like, for instance, um, I was talking to a buddy of mine in an unnamed place in Texas. And I was talking to him about um, starting a church, brick and mortar, XO, in his city and asking him about the spiritual climate of that city and if he thought that city needed a gospel, another gospel presence. And 
um, I said, but we want the church to be multi-ethnic, multi-racial, just diverse, as diverse as the community is. And he said, man, you know, that's really not going on in our city. He said much. He said, I can name maybe two fellowships that are attempting to do it, but they're not very successful. He said, one is more successful than the other one. And it's a great model. He said, um, but I, I think if anybody can pull it off, you could and your church could. You know, one thing that I've tried to do with EXO and I'm trying to do it better now is giving people a diversity, knowing that very well, although I think I'm a great preacher, everyone will not share that sentiment with my style. Now, I, I think my, my message is solid, but each one of us have a different style of presentation. The word needs to be the same, but the style of presentation is absolutely different from person to person in XO. And I think that needs to be highlighted. That's one reason why we started the Thursday night services and eventually we're gonna go to maybe a Tuesday night service or something like that. But um, so we can reach as many varied people with a different amount of gifts and talents and capabilities that God has planted inside the church. Now, when, when you talk about, like for instance, I wish, God knows I wish that we did not have to talk about the Lord's church in terms of racial identification. I wish it could just be church. Um, when you go to certain places in the world, they don't have those stigmas of a black church, a white church, stuff like that. Um, you know, uh, I, I, I can't even explain what's in my heart about, like for instance, Tim, even though y'all can't see Tim, Tim's my brother. I, I really look at Tim as my brother because I look at John G as my brother too. But uh, they're my brothers. And when I, when I look at them, I know that they're white. But it never comes into play. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just that's John G. That's Lisa G. That's that's okay. Tim and Sam. I, 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 it's not like I can introduce him and say that's my white brother, because because the thought never comes up in my mind. And and I don't know if that's just the way God wired me, or I've been around them so long until it just don't. But when I look at the body of Christ, I don't, I don't see, I see it, I notice it, but it doesn't come into play. I, I don't know how to explain that because I, I see white people. I see, or wouldn't that be a good line to take out for advertisement? I see white people. I see, I see white people. I see black people too. I see, I see Mexicans. I, see, I, I know people are culturally and ethnically different. Yeah. But in my relationships, they're just relationships. They're not, you know, like some people try to tell me one line that a lot of black people in the U.S. find offensive is when, when white people say, but I, I have black friends. You know, they're like, what? You know, and that doesn't necessarily go over well with them. And so, but the idea is that we are a part of the body of Christ. And in the early church, listen to me, there was no distinction between those of African heritage and those of any other heritage. And, and let me explain why. When you look at church history, and then I'm gonna shut up for a minute and let y'all say something. When you look at church history in the first 500 years of church history, early church history, you wouldn't realize that Africans were the ones who solidified the doctrines that we hold dear to the church today. They solidified the nature of God, the nature of Christ, God the Father, the nature of God the Son, the nature of God the Holy Spirit. Um, they solidified um, salvation through faith along Augustine. Uh, the most prolific preachers that we ever have, we still have their stuff, their sermons are primarily Africans. And you can go, I could, I could pull up Chrysostom sermons and preach them tomorrow. And you all would think it was a contemporary sermon that I created. 
that he has over 10,000 sermons or homilies that's still preserved. The most prolific one, it was called Golden Mouth. And, and, and then the guy who, uh, who solidified the New Testament for us, Alexander, uh, Athanasius of Alexandria. He was indeed the one, uh, they called him the little black midget. You know why? Because he's a little I, midget. And he was black. <laughs> we're, like, we're like 12 year olds in here sometimes. <laughs> oh, that is funny. Well, you know why they call him the little black midget? The world, right? He was little and black. <laughs> God yeah. help me. And so, but he was the one that determined what our uh, 39 books in the New Testament would be. So, so uh, you know, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. 27 books in the New Testament before somebody writes me. 27 books before somebody writes me. Um, so, so, but anyway, so, so that's what we we come from a heritage that didn't put a lot of stock on your ethnicity. I think right. because mainly because, you know, God let the sheet down with Peter, mm -hmm. right? Filled with all unclean things. And, and Peter, he told Peter, rise, slay, and eat. And Peter said, I ain't, I ain't, I ain't, I ain't. God said, don't call what, what I've created unclean. Mm -hmm. Now get up and go to Cornelius's house, you know? And so, but anyway, so what do you all think about that idea of the cultural? I think Christianity ought to be its own culture. It's supposed to be. That count inside a community. In it's a and yeah. yeah, exactly. That's what I think. I think the fixation on race and one's own culture is definitely a carnal, a carnal flesh, earth kingdom mentality. Christ said, you know, the, the word came and it changed everything. He said, now there's neither... Jew, nor Greek, nor any other thing. If you're in Christ, you're no longer a black man or a white man. Like, I never have identified by my race, ever. Like, I don't think of it at all, you know? And that's not, but maybe it was because of the way I was raised. I wasn't raised to look at other people's race, and, and it, you know, I think the 70s and 80s and 90s was like a great time, because it seemed like it all just melted away, you know? And um, it's like the 2000s, it got resurrected for some reason. I thought we were doing pretty good but i think america's race fixated more than the other countries and that's why there's not a lot of division um one reason is um probably the united states is probably one of the only countries that you know i say north america and probably south america too because it's one of the only um places on earth that black people are a minority yeah i mean that's yeah. just the truth i mean on the earth's population you know, the, the minority are not black. You know, it's not a minority. Right. African is not a minority. Uh, right. So in America, it's different. You know, the, the, the makeup is different. Smaller percentage of numbers. I think that may, you know, and then our our uh, church histories got divided around the, as far as in the um, full gospel movement with the uh, Church of God in Christ and the Assembly of God and all their their different styles could not mix not worship wise but like their structure like the bishops and and um you see all that carried on and the assembly god didn't carry on the bishops they have a presbytery it's totally different but they you know i know about all that stuff but i believe it's that not. and now here's a this is a question this is my question and it really seriously because if you were going to plant a brick and mortar church in a town that has you know one percent this person one percent this person and um, 85 percent um, another person um, do you have to actively seek out to diversify I don't believe so <laughs> I think that that would be your intentions would you would create something that would have to be policed constantly you'd have to have all kinds of you know weird um, yeah. diversity quotas just to just to have service you know but if you don't acknowledge it right if you don't acknowledge um the different um, races are, that are made up in it. In America, you'll be considered racist. It would just be a white church. 
You know, yeah. like Joel Osteen's church, I don't, I, if you look at it by standards, by how many people go, that's a black church. There's a white pastor. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, uh, and I've never heard white people say, oh, you know, I really enjoy our white fellowship, or white this or white, it never. I've only heard that in, in um, African American community, honestly. And, um, mm-hmm. And um, I know that you guys, when y'all met me and Lisa, you know, that church was mostly family, a small fellowship. And, you know, everybody there but me and my family were black. A few other, I mean, there might have been one other family. And um, and I just, I mean, it didn't really make a difference. I noticed that most people tried to refer to me as Hispanic the whole time I was there. This is our Hispanic <laughs> couple. I was like, uh, you got a problem? At the base, it's like, it's like a way to ease us into the... <laughs> Yeah, y'all was doing something, you know, and I'm different though. See, it my life is different. I don't get to play with like everyone else because my yeah. entire life I've been a minority in my wherever I live most of the time. Um, and then you grow up at some in Oak Cliff, yeah, yeah. I was in Oak Cliff, South Dallas. It was a different childhood, you know. Um, and then moved to small country towns where things were segregated. It almost was weird to me when I mean segregated, but not by um mandate or anything it's just people lived on one side of the town came across the railroad tracks walking to school and you know everybody walked to school together and it was it was mind-boggling to me i didn't know who to walk with because it seemed very odd it was like you know what i'm saying i was like what am i doing here this is strange i just observed that's how i feel like i've lived my life observing from the outside everything that's going on when it comes to that stuff you know unless i get in a situation like when i went to jail i definitely Knew there was. Uh, hey man, you went to jail. Yes, I went to jail. <laughs> okay, okay, Pastor John G. <laughs> Is that too heavy? No, that's not too heavy. That's when I realized that you know my little bubble was burst about there not being racism in the world. Um, I'd been blessed to not have to be around people that were racist on either side of the aisles, you know. But but I saw it firsthand. You know, well, and, you know, uh, right now, right me now in, in the U.S., there's a big controversy going on. Derry brought it up to me weeks ago. I had already talked to uh, one of the people who are forming this dialogue. Um, and, and I'm not going to name him because I don't want to create no stuff. Right. But um, called Critical Race Theory. Right. And, and as much as I understand it is how African Americans have been mistreated, misaligned, um, marginalized, all of that stuff over the years, and it's had a detrimental effect on them, you know, from race issues. This is what I believe, and it may be simplistic. I, I, I do believe that racism is a problem in the US and around the world. But I think the one thing that will eradicate racism. I bet y'all can never guess what I'm about to say. Oh, it's not more social programs. It's not governmental relations, regulations. It is to have a vital relationship with the God of this universe through yeah. his son named Jesus. Yeah. Jesus is the one that changes everything. Amen. You know, uh, I, I remember S.M. Locker said that in a sermon, he said that men stopped acting like brothers in Cain and Abel's day. He said, when you're walking on a dark street down an alley at night and can't see nothing, and you hear footsteps behind you, and they start rapidly increasing, he said, what goes through your mind is not if that's a black man or a white man, but what goes through your mind is what is the condition of this guy's heart. Yeah, I hear that. Yeah, that's what S.M. Locker said, and, and Dr. S.M. Locker, and, and, and I tend to agree that, that the issue is not skin tone. The issue is whether or not it's a regenerate heart or an unregenerate heart. Mm-hmm. Whether or not the person is saved or not. Yep. And I know some people might say that that's simplistic. But let me tell you this. It's simplistic. It's simple. It's <laughs> simple. It really is. Because I think a lot of people like to focus on uh, patterns. 
okay, we're doing this time period, this is what happened, doing this time period, this is what happened. And this is what we tried to, this is what we attempted to do, like, oh, uh, let's do with the civil rights movement. We had all these leaders, these uh, preachers, these churches, the Baptist movement, and it was all gone home. And we made, we had some changes. Like I was just telling, uh, like I was dealing with somebody about the critical race theory this week. And probably you'll be doing it today. And um, mentioned that, uh, that we had some type of growth, we had some type of uh, progress. But the reality is, what she said, she said, like, we had some type of progress. But it's not uh, where we should be today. But the reality is that we didn't have any progress at all. New laws doesn't change the tradition tradition of man. We just got more laws. Somebody well, that's just like we had laws in the U.S. since slavery right. that was supposed to protect and uplift the African American. But now, let me give you this point. idea. Let me give you this idea. I, one of the schools that I went to is Criswell College in Dallas, Texas. Ooh, right, Lord, Criswell Lord. College. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm a Criswell man. Yeah. Anyway, so so in the 1940s and 50s, W.A. Criswell, Dr. W.A. Criswell, who founded the school, was the pastor of First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas, at one point the largest church in uh, in the U.S. Um, he made a lot of racist statements in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. A lot of racist statements. He, he was a racist. Mm-hmm. I love him though. Uh, and I believe it was in 1970. If I'm don't get me on the dates, but you can probably Google it, I'm guessing. He made a state, he made a series of statements concerning the fact that he was on the wrong side of scripture when it came to race, and he was repentant mm-hmm. of his racial ideologies and he started embracing people of every culture every ethnicity all of that stuff god changed him now a lot of people couldn't get past the statements he made in the 50s and 60s but the truth is god did change him and it was evident for the rest of his life that god had changed his understanding so so the thing that changed him wasn't a social program. It wasn't governmental regulation. It was the message of the gospel that made him fall in love with all people of all races. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, 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 so the difference maker is the message of the gospel invading somebody's heart. Yep. And, and I, I was talking to Derek and I told Derek, I just, and Pastor Tim, I'm gonna let you say something right after this, please don't go mute. Uh, I told Derek that um, as we were talking, I said the job of the church, the mission, the focus of the church is not race issues. Cause that's just one symptom of an unregenerate heart. You know, we could add raping, murder, stealing, uh, in Bells, we, we had a myriad of other things as symptoms of an unregenerate heart. And so the thing that I think that the church ought to focus on is getting people saved and discipling those who are. Okay, mm-hmm. Pastor Tim, I'm quiet. Pardon me for not showing my uh, face, but I think that's going to do you guys a favor. I've worked about 70 hours this week and worked about 14 yesterday. So um, I look rough. But no, all I was saying is I want to say in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, it says, let us make man in our own image. And it goes down further and it repeats itself. And so my thing was, what color was Adam? Because if Adam was, you know, white or black or tan or whatever, you know, what, what color would God be if God could be a color? You know, and so sometimes you see pictures of Jesus being white or black or Hispanic. I think he was more of a mid to dark kind of tan because he was a carpenter. A carpenter back then was not someone that slung the hammer and nails and put down floor. Uh, even though they did that, they were they were more of um, a day labor. 
and they just tried to find work and they did stuff. So he was probably outside quite a bit. <clears throat> so my thing is, if God would make bring down his son, Jesus, and I think he was more of the, the tan, dark tan kind of color. And I think you guys are right that some of the greatest pastors and theologians in the early church were non-white. And they were actually uh, black or dark tan. And so to me, when people are all hyped up about we're going to have white this or a black that, I'm like, wow, what? show me in scripture, right? Because really, when we think about it, we don't worship a white God or a black God. That's making a God, lowercase God, lowercase G. Like we just need to worship God and let him work in our hearts. And like you said, that um, when <laughs> you're more worried about the condition of the person behind you, who you hear footsteps at night, not so much their color. I think the same thing could be applied in the church. We're not so much uh, concerned about the people who are worshiping next to us, what color they are, just their condition of their heart and how we can impact them and how they can impact us. I think that's very powerful. Um, we are the body of Christ. Right? We are the body of Christ in all of its diversity. And one thing a friend of mine, um, and I won't go into a long detail of how he's my friend, but Iton. I met Iton down in uh, Trinidad, Tobago. Uh, great guy. He may even be listening to this now. Great guy. Uh, questions everything. Um, at one time he was in ministry. Now I don't believe he's in ministry right now. But he was down in Trini and uh, he was adamant about not bringing the U.S. style of church to Trinidad. He was adamant about it. He and Mark Moore, who uh, founded the group Christafari and um, and so he helped them develop their own style of worship down in Trinity. It was odd to me back then. It was odd. Man, was it odd. I, I had a hard time with why would they not want to worship the way we worship? This is the way you're supposed to worship. I hadn't evolved in my understanding that God is the God of the world and not the God that's exported from the U.S. I, I had a view similar to Jonah, you know, that if I stepped outside the U.S. borders, my, my goal was to make the rest of the world look like us. Does that make sense to anybody? But as I, as I matured, I started understanding that God was not just the God of the U.S., but he was the God of Ukraine. He was the God of Indonesia. He was the God of Liberia. He was the God of South Africa. He was the God of Mozambique. He was the God of Ireland. He was, he was God over the whole universe, over all of the nations of the earth. And, and just because people have a different expression doesn't mean that it's wrong. And I'm not talking about different theologies where Jesus is not God and all that. No, no, no. I'm talking about as you worship him, you may have a different, like for instance, I worship a lot with my hands up. You can't see it. Well, well, my hands up. You know. um, I worship a lot on the floor. I like to pray on the floor. Oh my God. <clears throat> I don't like to pray on my knees. I like to pray lying down on the floor. Prostrate. Yeah, I like I like lying down on the floor. Yeah. And so uh, it's something about it to me. I also like to holler while I'm praying. I like to holler while I'm while while I'm worshiping. I like to scream. I like to I like to dance in worship. I love to dance. That that probably comes from my African American cultural background. I love to dance during worship. Uh Sometimes I just defy the idea of being reformed. Right? And so, so, so I like to dance. I like to skip. And sometimes now, I like to run and worship. Just run around the church a while. I love that. 
Um, are you thinking you run around in the church or you seen other people run around in church? Nah, me, I like to run. <laughs> me, you ain't running your life. What are you talking about, preacher? Yeah, I like to run. John G, you seen him run around the church, ain't you? The only time you ran oh, yeah. was trying to, you trying to catch the boss man before he leaves on Friday to get your paycheck. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. <laughs> John G, have you ever seen me run in church? I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. <laughs> What's that, it, wasn't, it wasn't a big place. I, it wasn't a big place. When we were yeah. <laughs> You said it was a long run. It was a it long, was a long run. run. It was more of like a, a short sprint. We'd have to jump over <laughs> some chairs. It wasn't because we were pew hoppers. It's just because they were in the way. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I took all so, so. John, John, let me just tell you, that happened to me one time. I was at a church in Colorado Springs. And uh, Springs Harvest, it was just right after Lisa and I, Lisa got saved. The man, oh, I got caught up in this service. These, this, I'd never really been in a service of worship like this. It was a real charismatic kind of, um, I don't know. They were flowing. And I literally, I don't know. Oh, I took off. I was up close to the front and something, I just took off running. And I made a circle, and by the time I came back around, somebody handed me a flag. I don't even know what the flag had on. I just <laughs> with that flag. It was like, ooh, I was just running. <laughs> and that place went wild. That all started. I don't know. If, I don't think everybody started running, but it was wild, man. It was wild. Yeah. So I, I know what you're talking about. That's you know, something yeah. about. It. I don't know what it is. Yeah. Like, you just can't contain yourself anymore, and you just, you know, and I've shouted, like, so loud, and I'm pretty sure I blew some ears off some people, and I banged a tambourine one time, so I, I was hitting people with it, I was swinging it so hard, people were like, okay, let's take the let's take the tambourine away from John G, he's kind of wild with that thing, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, and so, you know, and, and some of these cultural expressions, I believe are, I believe most of them are, are guided and prompted by the spirit of God. And, and he works differently among different people. Like I've never been in a, I'm not going to call names of churches, in certain style churches and had the unction to run or to dance. And I think it's because in that setting, it would have took people's eyes off Christ more than putting them on Christ. Where in other settings, visible manifestations and behavior would focus people more on Christ and not on the person doing it. Right. I get that. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like my mom used to say, there's a time and a place for everything. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And so, um, so yeah, so, so you won't really see me in, in some churches in the U.S. running and shouting and jumping and dancing. You won't see me doing that. But in other churches, you'll see me doing nothing but that because it's not distracting. Now, the latter is who I am. So when I'm in other services, I have to restrain myself. Sometimes it's very difficult to restrain myself. Especially if the preaching get good. Make me want to hit somebody. I can't stand good preaching. I remember the first time I was in a church that uh, that was not uh, of a Pentecostal or charismatic or, you know, I've just been raised in most, that's what I was around, you know, uh, assembly yeah. gods, charismatic churches, Pentecostal churches. And the, and the first time I went to a, a service where, the, where um, I heard a message being preached, I literally was like, I didn't even know these people were saved. It was so quiet. It's so mellow all the way up to this guy started preaching and it blew me away. And I literally was like, can I say, man, can I hop up? Cause I was ready to get up there. And I was being, I was literally being blown away and God took something out of my mouth, you know, but, Oh, 
Where's all the ways to worship? There's a, but it's like the preaching is the same. Right. Because like, right. I've been to churches where a guy get up there and preach real soft and quiet, and the Spirit of God start moving, and the whole crowd act up crazy. Be there and see them preaching loud and strong, and everybody sitting still, being quiet, scared to move. I've been in services where they had to control me from hitting the preacher. Hitting him? I'm yeah. trying to knock him out. <laughs> they do that. Negro, that Negro was preaching, and all I can think about is, I, I got to get him. I got to get him. <laughs> yeah. And they had to restrain him because I was going to tear him up. That was good to me. I mean, that mean that sound like I thought it was good, but my God, I couldn't control myself. I he was yeah. preaching so, and all I could think about was, I got to get him, 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 you know, and so, but he preached that day, yeah, but anyway, so, so, I love good preaching, and, and like John G said, preaching, generally in the Christian context, is not going to be much variation in our messages at all, delivery styles are going to be different, you know, uh, I've seen, I've seen guys in Africa preach, a lot of them, yeah, are like me. A lot of them, yeah, all like me. Now you have this movement in Africa where a lot of them, I think, try to act more like U.S. preachers or English preaching preachers. Um, and maybe my my stuff is limited, but but uh, I've seen Africans, true Africans, preach, and uh, of course we invited many over, you know, to come preach for us, uh, and uh, you know they. You know, sometimes you get the ones that's all fired up and and the other time you get one trying to be like us. Does that make sense? And I, what I want everybody to be, be themselves. Because God called you. And if he didn't want you in, in the way that he made your makeup, why would he call you? Now, you need to be biblical, but expressions are a part of you. God calls you in your personality. With all of his idiosyncrasies, he called you. And so I have to remind myself of that too. Because, uh, you know, in many ways, I think I'm a, a, a poor preacher at best. And I don't say that as false humility. I, I, I'm always trying to work on my, on my preaching. I'm always trying to work on, on all the stuff because I want to get better. I want to deliver the message better. And uh, if you hang around me, you'll know that I, I, uh, I'm always working on improving myself in a lot of areas. Yep. And I'm always asking questions because I yep. question everything about myself. Um, yep. not, not my faith and, and, and stuff like that and who I am in the kingdom, but the expressions of that and how that looks. And I'm, I'm not insecure. Nope. But but I, I'm always evaluating and re-evaluating how I do, what I do, yep. why I do. Yep. You know, that's just, that's who I am. If you're around me for two hours, you'll see that. Now, I may get, like, if I have an issue, I may call 200 people. Yep. In order to formulate, okay, what is the majority opinion? And then I go, God, I need you to speak to me and drown out every voice but yours. That's just the way I do. You know, some people don't, don't call around and go around and talk to people about issues in their life. I do. I, I, man, I live so transparent. That's one of my goals of my life is to be transparent. I believe that if I tell everything on myself, the enemy, won't have nothing to come at me with because it's already out there. And some people think, well, it's already out there. People can get it and hurt you with it. Well, once I've dealt with it with the Lord and I really could give a rip what people think, you know, as far as that goes, you know, if he's delivered me from something, I'm delivered. All of us got issues from our past and we just put, if the skeletons never went away, none of us would be fit for ministry. Nobody would be fit if we kept all the skeletons out. Amen. man, mm-hmm. and then it would just look like it would like like they were told back then when Jesus was there. They were just whitewashed tombs. 
everybody looks good on the outside and appears a certain way, but nobody really knows what's going on, so they don't get any help. You know, yeah, that's what I really realize. Good. That's where my little saying comes from. Um, who you are right now. You know, yeah. not who you're hoping to be or who you used to be, but be who you are right now and be as settled and, and, and examine yourself. Know who you are. Don't be shy when something pops up. Be, you know, because we can start fooling ourselves to think we're so much holier and better. And I tell you what, you want to you wanna know um, a way to really get to know yourself. Have your wife go out of town for a week and a half. And then you're like, sitting here alone. With, I'm serious. With nobody to, I mean, ain't nobody looking over my shoulder. You know, it's like weird. And it's like, you know. You really have to, you just have to be self-aware and know where you are right now you know, so that you can be real around people. You know, the word of God tells us to be, um, you know, to be, be good around people. Don't, you know, don't intend to be, you know, coarse or vulgar or anything like that. You know? But at the same time, be as transparent as possible because regardless of the culture that the other people have come from or their background, Real recognizes real, and if they know you are being yourself and you are saved and you're confessing Christ, but you still have problems and issues that you're you have you're not letting them stop you, you know, from doing the things that, that God's done in your life and, and and not letting it stop you from growing. Actually, I believe you'll stop growing the minute you think you are you're okay. Yes, yeah. you know, the minute you think that you've got it and someone else doesn't. You're going to stop growing and see how God, God peels back something and he goes, oh, look, you here. You've got a festering wound that is infecting everyone around you. And you're over here thinking you are, you know, the most righteous and holy person. So I pretty much just, um, I don't know. Jesus, Jesus is the standard and I'll never meet it. So I just trust him and hide in him. Well, you know, like, um, why are you saying that? It's amazing to me, John G, when you talk about being real, real, recognized as real, the realest person in the New Testament is the Apostle Paul. He's so real, it's uncanny. It's disturbing. It makes him so crazy sometimes. King David, yeah. like, the Psalms are real. Yeah. When you talk about the Psalms, man, you're sitting there. Going, what voices are you hearing? He said, the voices are calling, screaming out against me. You know, he's laying in a cave by himself, hiding. He's talking about the voices, you know, because your mind, it comes after you, man. Yeah. Well, like, what about Paul? When he, when he starts putting out a litany, a list of people that have done him wrong, you know, and I'm in age, you kind of just say, you just say, well, you know, some people have been coming against me. I'm not calling them names. I'm not, you know, the other. Paul said, Demas did it. He just went down a whole list of people. Yeah, calling them out. Yeah. Yes, and he said, oh, yeah, be careful with this one guy. He treated us real bad. Stay away from him. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, God put it in the scripture. He even said, I'll give this guy over to the devil. Yeah. 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 And it's, you know, it's, Tim, if we said something like that in our modern culture, we'd be on the front page of the paper. Man, we'd we, we be stars. We'd be, on the, we'd be uh, known for sure. Yeah, but you need to be real, you know. Uh, but, but that's what, that's what Derek time. does. That's what Derek does. Real. Derek ain't real. <laughs> <laughs> Derek's real funny. <laughs> <laughs> I can hardly keep a straight face listening to him. Just answer. <laughs> Derek talks to holograms. Yes. Yeah. Oh, what's this? <laughs> we uh, call this episode when preachers make fun of the IT director. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. We're, just trying, we're just trying to keep him smiling and happy so we can keep doing this. It's the truth. It's He's the over truth. there holding the keys to everything all smug and his little. Uh, you know what I told him this morning when we got on? <laughs> I got on right after Derek. And, and my my ID thing said I had to wait till the host let me in. So when I got on, I told Derek, how is this my stuff? And I got to get permission from you to get in. You know, I told him. And he, 
He blames it on the iPhone. It wasn't the iPhone. It's, it's, <laughs> the, way, it's the way it was the setting he is. He didn't set me where I had to beg him to uh, let me on. That's, that's his way it's of letting Apple preachers device. know. Uh, that's his way of letting preachers <laughs> know that he's in charge. Good job. Good job. Well, in our Good denomination, job. in the denomination that Derek and I belong to, only safe people use Android. <laughs> Whatever. Hey, Apple Twitter race. Amen. We're trying to reach yep. the simplicity of the gospel. But that's simplicity. Am I the only one on this call today that has an iPhone? Yep. That has an Android. Jesus said that the way is going to be narrow and if you're going to be traveling. Hey, Lisa, Lisa uses iPhone. <laughs> yeah. And her videos always come out for it. Yes, yeah, she, she's been redeemed. But I've been praying that God would pray. Hey, God, what? Uh, be delivered. Be delivered from that spirit of iPhone. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And, 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 and nothing like the iPhone. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm putting like a plug demon. in for Mac and Apple on this yeah, station. Nothing like that demon. That what? It's nothing like that demon. It is nothing like that. Nothing like that. <laughs> but if, if we can do stuff on an iPhone that y'all can't even dream about doing on an Android. That's right. Mm -hmm. You're right. There's there's all kinds of stuff y'all can do on an iPhone, like only text message people on an iPhone. Your video messaging only works for other people on the iPhone. <laughs> FaceTime only works for people on the iPhone. There's all kinds of stuff only y'all can do. <laughs> Get them, John G. Get them. Closed, closed <laughs> network. Get them. Your emojis only work for each other. It's awesome. Mm, like it's not good for the gospel. Don't look cool. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Whatever. <laughs> y'all trying to dog my iPhone, but that's all right. I'm in the minority here because you know Jesus said the way to heaven is gonna be few people travelers every now and then. But on that other Broadway, it's gonna be here, it's gonna be packed with folk with our androids. You sound like one you know, of the Jehovah's Witnesses. In anyways, <laughs> can we get back to the topic at hand? <laughs> wow. Oh, wait, by the way, you said anti. Let me tell you, I had a conversation with Derek yesterday about the word any. And I remembered in my speech class in high school, I, I was deemed and didn't make a hundred on my speech. I made a 97 because I did not pronounce the word any correct. And I pronounced it as any, but the correct pronunciation for A-N-Y is Annie. Would you like any pasta? Yes. Would you like any? Any. Annie, Annie, are you okay? Are you okay, Annie? <laughs> it's Annie. It is anything. Anything, anywhere. We got, we got pizza over there. Did you get any? No, not if you didn't get any. Did, no, did you get pizza. Any? No, did you get any? Annie. Did you get any? Annie. Annie. Did you get any of that pizza? Annie of that pizza. Yeah. Wow. Oh Lord. Do you have anything you want to say? Anything. Anything. I say thing. So anything, I'm gonna mess it up. So anything. 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 Mm. Anything. anything. I'm just letting y'all know. Y'all play games, but I'm trying to get you to enunciate okay. correctly. Okay. Any, anything. Okay. <laughs> well, you know what? You know what's important? Any <laughs> I found this out too because using proper English, like okay, P Bella will probably has a harder time understanding us, not because we can't speak English, it's because he speaks proper English. Yes, 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 yes he does. Africa or Liberia, they speak proper English and they don't understand me because I speak so slangy country. You know, I'll, like I'll be saying something and, uh, that if I type it out proper, they're like, oh, okay. I don't yeah, know. I have to repeat myself to people in Africa. Yeah, because we don't time. speak English, John. We don't speak English, man. We speak, <laughs> we speak te uh, Texican English, Arkansas. Yeah. We have our own, we have our own dialects. There's probably, there's probably like 2,000 dialects in America. And we all, my like, family, my so family continues to make fun of me while I talk. They'll ask me, what, Dad, what you say? And Nina said, John, what was that? 
and I'll repeat it. But but when I know they say that, I I, I know that I pronounce something wrong. Right. And I, I, when I repeat it, I'll try to say it right. Well, and then okay. I said, that's what I said. That's what I said. What are y'all talking about? That's my own son. Same thing. We're, we're working on the garden together the other day, putting some uh, metal up to hold the vegetables so they'll hang on it. And I said, put that pole behind there. And then all of a sudden he started doing it all different. And I'm like, what are you doing? He said, you said, put that pole behind there. And he said, I guess your definition of behind is different than my definition of behind. <laughs> but we were looking at each other. You know what I'm saying? So his behind was not front. <laughs> like, oh, man, Lord, help us to communicate. That's yeah, why the Holy Ghost is so important. Yes, he is. Yes, he, he is. Our, he can fix what we, you know, he can make understandable what we you know, what we just try to do. Hey, I bet Bell and them don't have the problem with critical race theory because Liberia is like 99% black. Yeah. Bella, how many white people live in Liberia? Three? <laughs> Can you hear me? <laughs> I don't know, it, man, but just it might have screenshot this. <laughs> that moment. Tell how many black people life. live in Liberia? He froze up. He's just like it. Yeah. He's like okay. that Windows, you know that Windows lock off sound? That's what yeah. I know. Sure no. <laughs> well, he's stuck in one position, so I know that's not really him. He might have, he might have, he might have an iPhone. <laughs> no, that's an Android. No, he must have an iPhone. I think you gave it to him, right? That's an Android. We need to get him an iPhone so he won't have stuff like that. Happen. He's gone now. No, yep. he's too redeemed to have an iPhone. You think he got an iPhone? No, he's too uh, he's too redeemed to have an iPhone. Oh, he's a saved man. He is a he's a truly saved man. I know you. I know you working yours out, Pastor. Wow. You got an affinity. Wow. But our house is kind of split. We've got a Mac and a PC and Androids and iPhones. So I guess we're uh, My wife has an Android. I'm trying to get a couple minded. My house split too, but yeah. Hey, John G, you see all that white in my beard? Yes. Looks good, man. It is absolutely white, except yeah. for right in here on my mustache. How does it make you feel? This is from dealing with years of dealing with Tim. Do you feel like you have more privilege now? No. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. That was I it. have guys come up to me on the street say, hey, old school. I'm like, what yeah. do you think you're talking to? We are old school now, man. Your you birthday coming up. We are. Oh, it's too late. 50, man. I was at the gas you. station and this guy said, what up, old school? <laughs> Who is this man talking to? <laughs> And was it? I mentioned to you, Derek, and I said they called me old school. You said, "Well, Pastor, you are old school." Is that what? Did we have that conversation? We had a conversation. The thing is that you're older. Your birthday is coming. What's, what, how old are you trying, trying to fit into this? Speaking now I'm of uh, speaking Why of you uh, my age out on the internet. Whatever. And I can promise you this: everyone on this Zoom call knows his birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Don't think I didn't up on that, man. No, nobody have excuse. Oh, by the way, my birthday is June the twentieth. So like a year ago, it's like eight days something. from now. So make the check out able to Nina Smith. Yes. No, I don't. I don't need no check. I need everybody to give me one dollar. All my, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna make a Facebook post and tell them, hey, look, you got. I'm gonna make it today. You got eight days to, to give come me up one with dollar. I need all my <laughs> friends and my family to give me a dollar for my birthday. I can't I'm wait to see what your cousins say. Oh, they're going to say something crazy. <laughs> they say something real crazy. How many friends you got on your Facebook, man? That could add up to some money. I'm going to give you 50 cents. No, I need a dollar bill. No, and I need to I need, I need, I need, I need a I need I'm a businessman. I'm a businessman. I'm a businessman. I'm gonna cut you deal. I'll give you 50 cents. Uh uh. uh, -uh. That means from your house, Tim, I need a dollar from Sandy and I need a dollar from you. And if you feel real generous, you can give me a dollar for each one of them dogs you got. I knew you were gonna say that. 
<laughs> so, like I said, I'm gonna give you fifty cents. One dollar, one dollar, one dollar, one dollar. For just one dollar, you can feed this man in Arkansas. <laughs> and if fifty of us get together, we can help him get his stash of fried lobster bills. Oh man. You know, when, you know, we're gonna have to plan a retreat for every, for all of XO leadership and and members. Hey, look, if, if y'all are part of my XO, house. y'all want to reach up here, y'all want to come visit the pastor. Come on, y'all could have just all came over here for a week, two weeks. When? Yeah, John G got a house. Y'all done missed it. Y'all missed it. Miss y'all big yard that we can put tents up. Damn. It would not be. It would be fun, but we'd all be hungry. Oh. Till Lisa comes back. No, I'm gonna cook no. today. Now that's why guys would learn how to cook, right? We would we would cook off the land, right? We catch a squirrel, kill it, and dress him out, cook it. And there's been no music in my house. You know, there's been no music, no fresh food. This is terrible. <laughs> you know, you are the DJ though, John G. I uh, know, but I don't like music anymore. So I'll just sing us a song. I'm gonna sit here. And... We it's appreciate wrong. you coming to Pastor Coffee with Pastors as we talk about Batman, Spider Man, and critical race theory, and all kinds of weird stuff and different styles of worship. My <laughs> least is the one, man, because I, I can't do it. I said it's a long. Can't do it. <laughs> now I don't think I can't make. Hey, it Tim up. can sing for us. Tim, go ahead and sing a song, Tim. Oh, now he goes quiet. No, I only sing the song when the Lord tells me to sing the song. Not when pastor. No, we, oh. no we, we, we need you to sing one right now. No, I'm good. Uh, Gotta understand. And then we, um, we get Gary to cut it out and we're going to put it on Facebook. You only, you only sing when the Lord tells me to warm up. Oh, oh, speaking of cutting it out, we got this video of our pastor singing. Do, Do not. not pastor, yeah, pastor can <laughs> sing. Do not. Hey. <laughs> Do not. <laughs> See if I can find it. <laughs> Let me no, only go through the words, the words, the words. I'm going to fire you. I'm going to fire you if you do. I'm going to fire fine. you. That's fine. That means I get to go sleep early on Friday night. I, I, I'm a, I ain't saying fire you from your job. I'm going to fire you. I'm going to set you on fire. <laughs> <You're the best. laughs> We're going back I'm going to go back, uh, yeah. go back to my base nature and I'm going to set your behind on fire with gasoline. So, violet preacher. <laughs> but yeah. if you okay. had an Android, you wouldn't think about setting someone on fire. Exactly. Okay, Siri, please uh, rewind and delete the last two minutes of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> my mama used to tell me that she'll beat me and make me think my, my drawers was uh, set on fire with gasoline. That I have gasoline draws on, and she had set me on fire. Yeah. In other words, she was telling me, "You keep doing what you're gonna do. I'm gonna tear your behind up." See, I grew with up those, with parents, with when those parents kind of whooped children. Yeah, and with those kind of threats, you still didn't act right, did you? Because <laughs> you knew she wasn't gonna grab no can of gasoline and chase yeah. you around the yard. Now, <laughs> if my mom would have said that. I'd have started hiding the matches because I don't know what she, you know. <laughs> with, with John G, I'm, I met John's um, mother. And let me just tell you, I've never been so afraid of someone in, uh, after meeting him for 10 seconds. So let me just tell you, she probably would have grabbed something and had some fire and chased my boy. You were scared well, of her? I DJed her birthday party, man. You sure did. You sure did. I didn't know I, didn't know I was the first white person on her property, though. John failed to mention that. I didn't even <laughs> have idea. I didn't know. I didn't even know I was white. <laughs> yeah. But see, when you walk in John G's mama's house or around John G mama, you just feel nasty spiritually. You feel like you feel like I'm so <laughs> in <inadequate laughs> That's so funny, man. <laughs> you feel like I need to pray more. <laughs> Yeah. She has. Uh, oh, man, she, she was getting me on the phone, and I'm like, get off the phone. Get off the phone before you start confessing everything. If 
defense and stuff I did in the eighth grade. Thank the Lord. Yeah. Y'all yeah, need to be around her for about 30 minutes. And you no, understand what I'm she saying. Is, she, is one of them. she is so funny, though. She has got the best sense of humor. But yeah, man, there ain't nothing to get past her. Yeah. She, she'll tell you, the Lord was talking to me the other day. And he told me, X, 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 you like. Okay. And then she does it in a way like, I don't know if that's the Lord. And she just slaughters the soul. Like she just chomps your life in half. Now, I don't know if that's God or not. I'm like, other than the part where it was completely verbatim and you're talking about the future, past, and the present all at the same time. Yeah, mama, that's God. But now I'm a little scared. I'm going to go home and pray. Yeah, she always leaves in with that. Then she judges that I don't know if this is God or not. Yeah. Because she don't like, you know, she's not going to thus say it the Lord. But she's going to say, you know, I had a dream. And I saw you doing this, 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 this. is I'm like. Yeah. Oh, man, that 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 you know, I you know that must have just been something you ate, and then I hang up the phone going, "Oh my God, <laughs> Lord!" <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. I got to move on, man. I'm so thankful. Oh, I'm so thankful. Yeah. God, I don't even, I don't even, man, I don't even know how to say how thankful I am for having somebody who hears from God and will tell you, even if it ain't pretty. <laughs> Yeah, you know, in uh, in less charismatic Pentecostal circles, people with uh, the older women in church would, wouldn't say that thus said the Lord. But And Tim, you might, I don't know if you're old enough to remember this either, but they, those old saved women that looked so godly in their dresses and walking with canes and stuff, they would say, I had an unction from the Holy Ghost. Yeah. <laughs> and then they start telling you stuff, your eyes be like, the Holy Ghost told you that? And then after a while, you just you try to avoid them, especially when you've been doing stuff. Cause I had an unction from the Holy Ghost. Like, yeah, I'm telling you, you meet somebody that says that like you say, well, what do you, what you know, what kind of ministry? And they're like, oh, I don't really do ministry. I, I intercede and I pray. That's what I like to do. And you're like, oh. they terrify you. That's somebody they that terrifies you because they've been praying all day. Mm. Every word that comes out of their mouth. It's somebody who don't mind asking God for something. They don't mind hearing God. Mm. This is scary. I have yeah. several people who are intercessors for me. Uh, that's that's what they believe God has called them to do is to intercede on my behalf. I, I, I guess I need a lot of prayer because I have several people who say God has called them for that particular ministry of praying for me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I'm always thought, God, why do you need more than 15, 20 people praying for me like that? It's, Am I that bad that you got to have that much prayer warriors for me? But anyway, they'll call me and say something like, like John, I was praying for you, and uh, I just felt the Lord saying, and I'm like, okay, okay. And you don't want them to know that they didn't just nailed you to the wall and cut your throat mm -hmm. out, right? You just say, yeah. thank, you for, thank you for praying for me. Thank, thank you for praying Amen. for me. You know, you know, so when those old ladies... Uh, Miss Mary Johnson, one of them, uh, taught me how to pray when I was 13 years old. Um, Derek, didn't I introduce you to her son? Oh, no. You introduced me didn't to me. Did you go with me to the funeral in, in Atlanta a couple of weeks ago? Yeah. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Yes. I introduced you to Kevin, right? Yeah. 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 The one that was jumping up all over service. Yeah, you did. He was funny. Okay. His mom was one of the three ladies that taught me how to pray all summer. Those ladies were, they weren't preacher women. They were nothing like that. They were just, they just loved Jesus and loved to pray. They would pray for five and six hours a day together. And then they would pray other times by themselves, but five or six hours every day together. And I, when that first time I went up, I thought, how are they going to pray for hours? They did. And it wasn't like, it wasn't really like they were repeating themselves either. Mm -mm. You know, they were praying. And ever since then, I've desired to be a prayer. I, I, I do it well, then I don't do it so well. I do it well, I don't do it so well. But I do love to pray. You know, so. Tim, did, you had people like that in your life too, didn't you? Is he still there? Yeah. He gonna... I do. Yeah. I do. 
He says yes, I did. Lady, I did. There was this lady. Um, I went to church. I wasn't on staff because I was. Uh, I took some time off uh, from ministry, so I could focus on studies, and uh, I worked two jobs too. So I just did some um, late, late, late ministry. And there was this lady. She was probably in her eighties, and she started the prayer ministry of this church. It's a large church, just west of Fort Worth, and um, probably like seven hundred, six fifty on Sunday morning. And um, anyway, she'd have this white teased hair and she was very light, light skin, but wore white makeup and had those godly dresses that you're talking about. Right. Mm -hmm. And it was really thick, thick shoes. I mean, those must weigh like five pounds each. Right. And she's walking down the hallway, the church. We're going in the sanctuary. I open the door for her and she looks at me and says, I'm going to start praying for you more, Tim. And she goes and sits down. And I'm just like, uh, thanks, I think. <laughs> and then she would come to me and says, I prayed for this. You didn't tell me what to pray for. So I just pray praying for you about such, such, and such, such. And I said, okay, that's what I needed. And so every time I see her, she just give me that nod like, I got you. But it's like they already know like what you're saying. Like you you try to avoid them because you know what, you know what, they know what you've been doing. <laughs> <laughs> but she was a very godly lady she ran the prayer ministry at the church she's the only lady who uh, was able to only church member who had because you know, when you're a pastor of a church of 700 to a thousand you know your time is limited right and right. you have associates and other people who take care of other things and so she's the only one who had access just to walk into the office if the pastor was in a meeting he says i gotta go by and she would walk in and, and, of course, it wasn't closed doors. You know, there was, you know, they had some windows and stuff. And so that was secure. But she was the only one that I knew of that could just walk in and stop the pastor, what he was doing, and just have time for prayer. Now, you know, that's powerful when, when, when you have that, right? Yeah. Man, forgot to raise up prayers in our church. Amen. Mm -hmm. Like the Mama Junes of the world. Man. John G, would you say that your mom spends an a extreme amount of time in prayer? Yes. I didn't realize how much, but yes, she does. Mm -hmm. She does. She spends a whole lot. Yeah. Yeah. And Lisa, Lisa does too. So I married someone. I know Lisa does. Yeah, Similar I to my mom. Think. Like, she really does. She said, I just, she said, just give me. You know, the list of whatever needs to be prayed for, of what's going on, even at XO. She said, I need to know more because I got to have them. Like, you know how it is. It's like, if you're, that's what, I mean, man, you just get called into that. And it's such a deep relationship. It's like, it's like you're really friends with God. You know, you're not just, right. Like, me, well, that's just like, I Mr. pray G. all the time, but, you know, it's just it's something where you spend a lot of time. And you just get comfortable, you know, you're not having to spend 20 minutes of adoration just to get yourself <laughs> clear. Right. Oh, holy God, I don't, I don't deserve anything. Yeah. <laughs> Lisa just runs in and goes, Daddy, this lady needs a heart. You know, Lord God, help her, give her a brand new heart. You don't ask for people to be like healed or fixed and the doctors to be guided. She goes, Lord, give them a brand new arm, give them a brand new heart, give them a brand new heart. <laughs> But ask me big and real without any doubt or fear and be sick herself. That's what my mom, too. It's like in their weakness, they pour out and ask God for others. It's just something. It's amazing. I, I don't want that kind but, of heart. But also, Lisa G uh, experiences uh, an extreme amount of God speaking to her, too, doesn't she? Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. That's what I've noticed about people who pray a lot. God talks to them a lot. Well, it's just like you and me. If I talk to you a lot, you're going to talk to me a lot. Right. It's conversation. So. It's conversational. It's it's the it's the it's it's like the peak of the gospel is to yeah. be made one. Derek, we, we solved our problems. Stop talking to Pastor ready. John, and we got our, we got extra time during the day. Uh, <laughs> Wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> Tim, if I was close to you, 
I would act like your Indian ancestors. I'd scalp you. Come on, big bad. I'm ready for you. Big Wolf is ready for you. <laughs> we get it on. We get it on video, right? Pastors yeah. trying to scalp each other. It'll go viral. It'll go I'll viral. Which is Android? Huh? I missed it. When these pastors culturally appropriated <laughs> French form of scalping on each other. Yeah, it'll go viral in about two hours. That's all we, I got. We just call it. We just call it staff meeting. <laughs> oh, whoa. Staff meeting. Yeah. It wasn't any corporate sitting. Yeah. Well, guys, I guess I'm going to let you all off because I'm, I'm really about to drive around. I got to find me a fishing place. I'm supposed to be doing it yesterday, but I came home and bedged out. And uh, I'm going to go riding around for about an hour, hour and a half, trying to find me a uh, couple of spots to go fishing in. And so uh, that's my desire. And so within the next, I guess, 10, 15 minutes, I'm going to uh, be riding around Central Arkansas trying to find a place to throw a reel. Because that's what I love to do. I love to fish. And by the way, if anybody ever invites me for ministry opportunities, one day needs to be spent fishing. Okay. And so be praying for us, please do. We we do solicit your prayers. That's one of the most powerful things you can do for us. Amen. The most powerful thing for us is pray for us. Mm -hmm. Guys, y'all have anything else y'all want to say? We've been on here an hour and a half. Y'all got anything else you want to say? <clears throat> um, don't let your culture stop you from sharing the gospel. <laughs> To other people of a different culture, whatever it is. And the gospel needs to intercept your culture if it's ungodly. Exactly. Amen. Absolutely. Damn, like you it up, but he didn't say nothing. Amen. Low God. Okay, I love you guys. Love, you Pastor. love you guys. Yeah, I have a hey, I'll call you about that staff meeting. <laughs> 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 <laughs>